Welcome back, everybody. It's Bolo Project Chapter 9. And with all of the foraging done, we are grinding scale off of the blade on both sides, just building a flat. We're using a uh, old worn-out belt. Well, mostly worn-out belt for this part of the process. The scale's hard on belts, and I just need to get the bulk of it off before I really start grinding clean steel with a fresh belt. It's all kind of part of conserving materials and not wasting money when you don't have to. So right here I'm just taking off any high spots, trying not to grind in any divots, and just um, barely start the process of building quality flats, evaluating things as I go. I've switched to a sharp belt now that I'm getting down to some cleaner steel. And I'm just kind of reading the blade and seeing what it's telling me. And that's starting to look pretty good right there. Let's have a look and uh, see what the next step might be. All right, a little progress report. So you can see we're getting this blade pretty clean. Where you can see some scale here at the belly, that's because of the drawing that we did in this section just to pull that width out a little bit wider. So this is expected. There's still plenty of edge thickness and it is centered to work with here in terms of grinding our edge into it. Same thing on the other side you can see. Everything else is cleaning up. We have isolated small scale patches barely left and those will grind out nicely pretty soon. Nice flat surface. Not too much in the way of faceting. Just put on with that sharp belt, flat platen. And we're clean all the way up to here. Clean to here. The spine is clean all the way down. No seams, no scale. The edge is clean all the way down. No scale, no nothing. Barely had to take anything off and that's good because when you have an edge bar with composite Damascus, you want to always forge as close to profile as you can and barely have to grind anything off because you don't want your edge bar to be um, demonstrably interrupted or changed in width or shape. Um, it'll be a little bit wider here because we forged it out, but it will gradually get wider and gradually get smaller, and I think that the effect will still be quite acceptable. So right now we are at... Uh, now hold on, bear with me. Let me get uh, something a little bit more sophisticated to measure with. Apparently sophistication is hard to locate around here. Okay, so digital calipers, turn them bad boys on, close the jaws, zero them out. Let's have a look at uh, what kind of thickness we got on this and that. Okay, 235. 235. 230. So pretty much within five thou all the way down here, 230 to 235. That's good just a little bit under quarter inch um, and that's that's great I don't want a big thick blade for for this thing I never like how a chopping um, instrument feels unless it's an axe if it's got too heavy of a of a thickness on the spine out here uh, by the time we get to the point we're at 
0.102. So there is already some distal taper that we have put in. We'll put a little bit more in just um, to make the knife balance better here at the edge. Let's see. Oh, 238, 240, 236, 223. So also tapering here, but within 10 thou of the spine here, the, the edge is actually a little thicker. So that's good. We got plenty of room to grind a nice blade out of this. Guard is big and chonky. We're going to actually um, grind a starter bevel on this and then actually start putting in the flat bevel onto this blade now. We're going to leave our edge at probably 60 thou thick for now before heat treat because I don't want any big warp. And then we'll finish grind it all after heat treat. But uh, once we get the bevel put on, then we'll pay some more attention to blocking the guard down further toward a refined shape. That's where we're at. Let me do something else here real quick. So I want my grind to come in about here. And let's just put that there on both sides. Mark it to where we can see it from above. See that? And then we're going to take and just draw in a mock plunge line. Just for now, just for temporary. Just so we kind of have an idea marked out on the blade of what we're shooting for. And that way, that way it just makes it a little bit easier to not grind anywhere that we might want full thickness still. We're going to mostly stay away from the plunge cut area as we're rough grinding the blade, but never helps to have lines to color inside of even at this stage. Never hurts. So I did include camera footage of a lot of grinding um, it actually took a lot longer than what you'll see in this video, of course, but I tried to just uh, include mostly highlights or anything that I felt would be instructive as to the pace or direction of the work. Um, some of these offer just stunning views of my left elbow repeatedly, for which I do apologize, but uh, hey, it is what it is. You can see here how I'm trying to evenly build that starter bevel onto the edge all the way down the blade length. On progress report. Okay, so you can see we've got a pretty even edge, a little facet here and there, nothing too major, pretty even edge ground, starter edge ground on here, all the way up through the tip, both sides. And uh, that's pretty even in thickness along through here. So it's about 60 thou all the way down. Let's see if we can sight down it on camera here. Pretty nice and straight all the way down that edge. I'm gonna call that good for a starter bevel. Then we're gonna start working flats up all the way up to the spine. Get rid of all this, get close to our plunge cut, and uh, just take a bunch of meat off the blade, take a bunch of weight out, and really start to define these bevels next. I used a worn out 36 grit belt for this, so I didn't strip a bunch of grit off of a nice fresh belt, but now we're gonna be switching to a fresh or almost new 36 grit to grind this big bevel in. Okay, 
you can see how I'm just building that initial edge bevel to be smooth and fairly evenly wide, wider yet, and pushing it up toward the spine gradually. I'm just creating a series of ever shallower bevels based on that, that starter grind, that witness line, and always being conscious of staying within my projected plunge line there with my sharpie mark. So you can see that I am really angling the blade up so I don't hit outside that line. I'm looking for spots that hopefully will come out. No, they'll come out. It's just a question of when. Now you can see me start to take a sectional approach to grinding the blade in zones, but more about that later. Getting a lots of nice clean steel there. Trying to alternate sides fairly often so I don't get a lot of grind warp. And I'm just cooling it in the dip bucket every now and then. Wipe it off with a rag. Let's talk about grinding a little. So we are at an intermediate phase with grinding this side of the bevel. We haven't gotten quite that far on this side. And what I did first was I ran a fairly consistent bevel all the way down here first on both sides, just to kind of set the tone to get some material out of the way. We had this already ground clean and straight with a slight distal taper. And then we had this ground to an even thickness of about 60 thou all the way down and also straight. So that gave us the edge and the spine as boundaries to grind to. Now, while you're grinding and you're grinding edge up, you're looking at the edge here the whole time and you're looking at the belt where it meets the edge and the gap between the two and adjusting the width of that gap. And you can see there that there's a tiny little bit of bevel left there. I haven't met my witness grinding line, AKA starter bevel quite, because I've been continually visually maintaining a slight gap there while I'm grinding this in with the platen. In the recurve section, I use the corner of the platen a little bit by angling the blade. Out here in this wide section, I can use almost the full width of the platen and you can see that right now I have a pretty straight line across the top of this grind. That's just because I've been using that. I've been, that's an easy way to make sure that your grind is even, trying to maintain a fairly straight line. As we get up to the spine, I'm gonna allow it to curve a little to follow the spine. And I'm gonna make sure not to actually get my distal taper too thin here. We don't want a delicate point on this thing. I'm not thin enough to do a little bit of this and that, but not thin enough to be a liability on a chopping knife. Anyway, we've been walking the grind up. Soon it's gonna meet the spine here. I probably will stay a little bit, little bit short of the spine with this 36 grit. And uh, at the same time, we'll try to be meeting this just about, and then we'll be done with our rough grind in this section. And then I'll do this section in the same fashion, but relying a little bit more on the corner of the belt to grind this slightly recurved section. And then we will blend the two together and then uh, we will address the plunges, and I will kind of show you some about that. But for now, I'm just going to finish walking this up to the spine, 
I'm gonna rough this section in, get rid of this little scale pocket. The steel is looking nice and clean. I don't think you can see it on camera here, but I'm seeing the pattern just kind of peeking out at me a little bit as I go. That's always kind of fun. And uh, so I'm gonna actually catch this side up, then get them both up to the spine, then do both sides of the recurve section and then go to the plunges. Progress report. So nice, clean, flat bevel, edge to spine. You can see we didn't blow past our thickness on the spine. There is no bump here. We didn't blow past our thickness on our edge. There's just a tiny little bit of witness edge left there. The other side has been caught up. It is nice and flat too. And um, we didn't get our tip too thin. We ground the last inch or so from the top so we could see if we were preserving our distal taper. And then we just blended everything. Nice and flat, no faceting. You know, most days with a little practice, if you hold your face right and you eat your Wheaties and you don't neglect any of your major food groups and your heart is pure and you got out of the right side of the bed, then you can totally grind something like this without any major dings. Uh, so now we're gonna do this on both sides. Let's talk real quick about why we're doing it in sections. Um, it's difficult. This is a complex motion that you need to grind an entire blade shaped like this. This is a mild S curve all the way. And you can do that complex motion and you have to be able to, to, to do the finish finish grinds on this, but it is not economical to keep having to make that motion while putting any real power to your grind. It makes more sense to work to be able to grab the blade here where you have better leverage and control and choke up on it and really lean into grinding this as a section. Um, and this, this is just, you know, one arc, a straight section and an arc you have to make. And then now I can actually grab onto this and really control the blade well while I'm grinding this section. I'm relying less on being able to leverage the tang or guard, so that helps. And now I just have a relatively easy motion to make in here too. It is recurve, but I'm only staying in this arc section. I'm not having to blend out into an S curve while I'm taking the bulk of this off. And then I'll only be making an S curve travel when I'm just blending the two at the end. So sections made sense on this. There is no completely proscribed way of grinding anything, but you just have to be able to think through it and work economically. We got a nice, flat, clean recurve bevel all the way up the one side. And you can see that right now, this is pretty much of a hack job, but importantly, it's a hack job inside the line. I was just, you know, carving away at it, getting the material out in a timely fashion. But I stayed inside what would become the plunge cut, and that's the important part. So once I get the other side up to this far, we'll actually take a look at how to control the plunges to be the shape that you planned them to be. Pretty looking thing. This is a difficult thing to capture on camera while grinding for several reasons. But I will explain my way around it as best as possible. So you can see I have a mark to grind to. I might freshen up the mark a little bit before I'm actually grinding much, but uh, I can see it. I have a light right here pointing this direction, kind of at the back of the platen, in at an angle, and down. So when I hold this knife here, I can actually look over from this direction down and actually see this line and this side of the blade while I'm grinding up to it with the corner of the belt. So I can use the corner of the belt like a crayon to grind inside this line while I'm watching what happens, watching the blade actually come off of the grinder in real time 
And being able to do that, it then becomes very much easier to get any shape you want because you're not grinding blind anymore. It's all about looking over the top of it at the backside while you're grinding and having sufficient light and a mark to grind to. Let me see if I can do any of that on camera here. So you can see we got a lot closer just there with that little lick that we hit. We didn't hit it anywhere out here. You can see the only really shiny spot is right here because when I was grinding, I actually leaned this portion of the blade out, out here off of the platen just a slight amount to where it wasn't contacting, but not steep enough to where it's digging a ditch. And I kind of float it in there and I watch this while I'm grinding it. And I just take off little bits as necessary using good body mechanics so I'm braced up and I can move my arms in a stable precision way. I'll try to take some different camera angles maybe and show it a little bit more. Now here I'm keeping my arms very close to my body and I'm trying to stand in such a way that my balance is good so I have good control over where the blade is in a very finite way at all times. You can see I'm pushing the blade into the plunge there at the corner of the belt with barely any feed and then I apply a little pressure as I'm pulling the plunge cut back out of the corner of the belt. So I just kind of ride up in there, apply a little pressure and ride back out and that helps me just kind of like wipe the um, shape that I want carefully onto that top corner. Okay, so you can see how in a very controlled fashion, what you could see while I was grinding is what I could see while I was grinding. And I was able to get a full depth nearly full depth, we're still before heat treat here. Smooth, pleasant curve. Dang close to where I drew it. I could have gotten it exactly up to where I drew it, but we're still pre-heat treat. I'm gonna save that little finish grinding for after we get this thing hardened and uh, all ugly again with some scale and stuff. And now I'm just gonna do this same thing on the other side off camera we'll have a look at the results um, after I get done with that and now we're good here too again nice smooth pleasing line gentle arc at the top close to the line but not over it good enough for heat treat and we will get the rest later and right down here from below, see if we can see that. Those are pretty darn even with each other for now. We'll get them better once we're at uh, about 120 grit or even with the A100 gator belt after heat treatment. But we are good for now. So that concludes major bevel grinding and plunge cuts for the entire blade pre-heat treat. Now I'm going to work, uh, work on shaping the guard a little bit and stuff like that. Definitely took a lot of weight off grinding that. Still feels clunky enough that we're going to want some additional weight reduction measures. But it's looking good. That's enough grinding for a minute. Let's just take a nature break. Happened to pop outside for some air and noticed there was a nice sunset happening. 
over the mountainside behind my shop. Ponderosa pines and our nice arid hills and the smell of sagebrush. Mighty peaceful after a lot of hard work. But no rest for the wicked. Here we are, working on the shape of the guard now. What I've got on here is a 120 grit belt. I've already done a lot of rough shaping in much the same fashion as what you're seeing here um, with a 36 grit belt. Now I'm just refining the surface a little bit, refining the lines a little bit more, getting in there with the corner of the plat and then just kind of carving with the edge of the belt. I am paying attention to the fronts of the bolster faces and then the flats of the Ricasso at the 90 degree corner where they meet up with that. So here I'm going to switch the Broadbeck grinder to the slack belt attachment. I left this in just so y'all would see how kind of convenient it is on this machine to change. This is a nice machine to have exactly for this kind of work. This allows you to really get the belt into some places that would be real hard without an attachment like this. Let's see what I mean here. Most platens are just too thick to fit in there into a notch like that. And this allows me to just kind of blend it. The face of the guard down below there on the lug is just a little bit domed. And so this does a nice job of blending all of that. Put a check hatch on it. You can see the explosions are pretty well separated. They're nice and spiky, but they're not completely isolated in black. I had a little bit of mush over and got some 15 and 20 crossing the line during my uh, re-square or re-stack for these. I still like the look though. Always something to work on with getting your explosion edges just right. But I have a direction to pursue now, so that's good. My favorite thing about this is how smoothly the edge bar follows the profile of the edge. I'm very happy about that. And that's because we bent the tip up like that, as I said. And it doesn't change the look of the pattern much at the end. We don't really have any drawing distortion in that. Not perfect matchup from tile to tile. And that, um, that was pretty inevitable because the pattern within the block that we tiled out was a bit asymmetrical from side to side. We would have had to etch every tile, match grind each tile together. I didn't want to waste that much steel. And so I just put it together like this, and I'm happy with the result. It has a nice kind of a flowing look to it. Almost like a net of sea stars or something. It'll be a lot easier to see the detail in these little, like, mollusks in between the sea stars. Once we get a real finish and etch on this. And this edge bar ought to look a little bit better again too after we get it ground a little thinner and get a real etch to it. Again, we're at 60 thou here all the way down the edge. Both sides look about the same. So that's good. That means that uh, our edge is pretty centered in that bar. Patterns all the way good up to the guard here. Now the guard, isn't presenting pattern quite how I'd like right now. It looks good on the bottom. You can see the W's happening. And on the top, you can see where the W's are. You can see an explosion here and the beginning of one there. But we're just not at the correct pattern depth for full spikiness. And I don't know if we'll be there. Um, at least, though, 
the blade is pretty well centered in the bolsters and we are going to do a little bit of file work to this to increase the interest of the guard itself. So now we're going to start thinking about strategies for further fabrication towards finishing this knife. Now, let's talk about that a little bit. So, I have my pattern that I drew, and this is pretty close to that, but that's just a plan. And uh, whatever famous general Napoleon or whoever said that like the, the best plan lasts only as long as the battle begins. I'm paraphrasing. What we need to do is take what we actually have for a guard and tang here. We're going to mark them onto a piece of card stock. And we're going to create a specific handle pattern for the workpiece that we have based on the handle pattern that we already drew. We're gonna check it to make sure that the scales will fit within the envelope of that pattern. We're gonna measure the back of the guard here, see what the thickness is, and then, think of, and then we're gonna measure the thickness of our scales, add it up, figure out how thick we want our handle frame to be. So that's 0.845 right there. So let's say if the scales were 200 thick each, in the middle, that'd be 400, and our uh, guard would then have to be 485 thick. So we may be grinding some more off of this guard width, which could improve the pattern for one thing, and for another thing, it's it's frankly just a little heavy right now. So there's that. We've got this stock here. This is the other side of the bar we ripped to make the edge, and so this has the spiky 12-layer Ws in it. And uh, we are going to forge the handle frame out of this. So that's going to wrap around the butt of the tang here and be shaped to the profile of the handle. We're going to make that fit tight to the tang in front. And then we're going to see about uh, a strategy for locating pins to make it lock to the back of the guard well, repeatably indexed to the back of the guard so it can't shift when the knife is assembled. So we got a lot to work on. Uh, first thing we're going to do is just measure the scales, think about the guard thickness, and go from there. I'm pretty jazzed on these scales. Such nice looking bark ivory. Love that color. This texture is good. Anyway, so... Let's have a measure in the front and in the back. Oh, 840. Eight seventy three. So these are more than thick enough as they are for a guard this thick. Um, if we had a frame as thick as the tang is. So I'm going to want the frame to be slightly thicker than the tang. So both of these scales are going to need to get carefully sanded a bit thinner. Um, and then once we have our handle pattern made, we will profile the scales to the handle pattern. Well, not so. Once we have our handle pattern made, we'll make a steel pattern, forge the frame to it. And then um, when we know exactly how the frame is going to turn out and we get it fit to the handle and the tang and everything then this then we'll profile the scales last to fit the assembled frame and tang so it's, it's all going to be metal work for a while yet but just having the scales in hand at this point helps us kind of think our way through the thickness and dimensions of everything here at the guard and kind of plan for what thickness do we want the, the frame to be ideally i'd like to the frame to be close to the same thickness as the blade here so <clears throat> maybe quarter inch probably shoot for a quarter inch or maybe like two 230 to 240 on the handle frame thickness and then uh yeah next step yeah i went into the drafting table and took another tracing of the handle i had drawn so I could bring that out. Um, 
and flipped it over, held it to the um, cardboard here and used a ball point to go over it and press the graphite from the backside onto the cardboard here to transfer it. Then I checked the knife against it. Let's bring that over. And that uh, looks like this. So the knife fit the pattern from the drawing and the tang was aligned right. So I traced the tang, the actual tang onto the handle drawing. Uh, and then I shortened it as per the pattern. I have room to um, fabricate this tang stub here and thread it for the takedown. So that's good. So that'll all fit inside that envelope. This will basically be the outline of my frame. And then uh, I also had to check to make sure that it was gonna fit within the envelope of my ivory, which it just exactly barely does. So it's all good. Now I'm gonna continue making the steel pattern for the handle frame.